Hey kiddies, it's Triple Feature Tuesday as October continues with Motor City Horror. Detroit. That's right, October continues undaunted. I am up to about 20 separate horror movies. I hope you guys are maintaining a good pace so we can get something like 60 before the end of the month. I believe we can do this two a day. That's not too bit too much to ask for. This week we're going to look at one of the more recent trends in horror movies, setting it in Detroit. Now, I don't know how closely you followed it, but Detroit is kind of on the decline. The population has dwindled to less than half of its highest. I think at the highest point, Detroit had something like 1.6 million residents, whereas now they've got maybe 700,000. People are leaving. The jobs aren't there. The infrastructure is dilapidated and terrible. It's basically turning into something either as bad as RoboCop predicted or as worse because, you know, in RoboCop people were still there. In modern Detroit, people are leaving in droves. The city filed for bankruptcy and the mayor was or is still considering bulldozing about one quarter of the land just so they can somehow manage all the urban blight and horror that's happening right now. There's just wilderness everywhere. There's uh, just vacant buildings, abandoned homes, just lots that are nobody's doing anything with. It's just a shame. This was a major American city and now it is not even a shell of what it was. It's essentially a third world country, you know, in microcosm. And that affords a lot of great opportunities, horror movie wise, not to be, you know, too much of an exploitative scumbag about the whole thing. But you get all the terror that comes from familiarity of a mo of a modern U.S. city, but because utilities aren't working, uh, emergency responders aren't there, cell phone signal might not be working there, you can put your main characters in legitimate peril despite the fact that it looks like it's just around the corner. So that is interesting. We're going to look at three movies that are using this to great effect. Uh, we're going to go in increasing order of Detroit and the citizens of Detroit being major components of the film. So our menu is going to include Only Lovers Left Alive, Don't Breathe, and It Follows. Now Jim Jarmusch's quirky take on vampires I don't know why I used the word quirky in a sentence with Jim Jarmusch, because it's sort of redundant. It's about two vampires that spend a lot of time in Detroit. It's actually uh, Tom Hiddleston plays Adam, who is a reclusive vampire musician slash scientist who has uh, decided to live in Detroit, and then his wife, Eve, played by Tilda Swinton, comes and, and uh, hangs out with him there when, you know, he's lost his joie de vivre, so to speak. He has picked Detroit because you can hide in Detroit. He is in this dilapidated home that looks not unlike the Paper Street Soap Company house from uh, Fight Club. He is completely off the grid because of his scientific know-how gained from hanging out with Nikola Tesla. He is powering his house all by himself. He is in the middle of nowhere. It just happens to be a house in the middle of a city. There are really great moments spread throughout the movie where uh, Adam and Eve go out and about in Detroit and just kind of drive around in the middle of the night and there is no one. It is a veritable ghost town which is a phrase that is used to describe Detroit by its actual citizens right now. It's really really terrifying. Jarmusch uses it very well, very well. He finds these great locations. It, it was shot primarily in Detroit, but the reason it's where we start as opposed to where we finish is because the movie and the characters go all over the world at different points. But Detroit is the central location, and it is dilapidated and horrifying. And you can just get away with whatever you want. People will get murdered through this movie. The concern is less that they have to get rid of a body in the middle of Detroit and more, oh no, super rabid fans have figured out that Adam lives in this house. That just is not saying anything good about your town. Now don't breathe. I'm going to try to avoid spoilers since it is technically still in the theaters and you should technically go see it. It is uh, the latest movie by Fede Alvarez, the director of the really really great remake of uh, The Evil Dead. This movie was sort of a response to the response to The Evil Dead. A lot of people gave him some guff about it being a, you know, overly special effecty 
blood-filled uh, unoriginal remake. So he created a r original story with, uh, you know, as minimal as little blood as possible and as little special effects as possible. This movie comes by its terror legitimately. It is about three burglars in Detroit who pick the wrong house to break into. They break into a blind Gulf War vet played by Stephen Lang, who is... Simply terrifying. If you thought he's been imposing in other movies, he is essentially just Jason in this movie. He is a man on a mission, and he will not stop until he accomplish that mission, accomplishes that mission, despite the fact that he is blind. He get, uh, while the movie, all the exterior shots were filmed in Detroit, all the interiors were filmed in Hungary, because probably tax breaks. The house and the location is well established as being like the one house that is left in this neighborhood that everyone else has abandoned. And that might be because he's blind and just doesn't want to leave what's familiar. It might be because he may be doing some really shady stuff that these burglars have stumbled, uh, stumbled upon. Or maybe it's just this is where we picked the movie. And despite there being a burglar alarm and everything wired up, you get the sense throughout the whole film that there is no help to be had for our burglars. And, you know, one of the great things about this movie, uh, without go going into too much detail, is it's very fluid in terms of who you're rooting for at any given moment, which is a lot of fun. And this is aided by the fact that Jane Levy um, is playing our main character. She also played the lead possessed girl from uh, the Evil Dead remake and she's uh, quite charming and you can walk that tightrope between complete scumbag and sympathetic heroine and all throughout the film as they're trying to you know navigate all the pitfalls and situations they end up in there is no you know passers-by there's no police patrols just in the neighborhood or anything they uh, all the things that they like about the house when they case it in terms of it being secluded and being an easy target are the things that trap them in the end. And it's just really, really impressive. In addition to it being set in Detroit, all the characters are from Detroit and you can see them all. Uh, one of the main motivations for all of the thieving is to get out of Detroit because there is no future for any of them there. It's hard to think of another city that this is more plausible in than Detroit because of all the real life situations that it's going through right now. Finally, we have It Follows. I've talked about It Follows before, so we're not gonna go into too much detail about it. And, you know, don't wanna go into spoilers, but there is an STC, a sexually transmitted curse, where if you have sex with somebody that has the curse, the curse passes to you. The curse is that there will be an apparition forever walking slowly towards you. You can outrun it, you can buy yourself some time by putting distance between yourself and it, but it will always be following you unless you give it to somebody else. And the minute it catches you, it will kill you. This is completely filmed and set in Detroit, and throughout the whole film you get the sense that this is a place out of time. No, not necessarily in terms of creating a timeless atmosphere so that the movie will always be relevant, so much as Time has forgotten this town. There is anachronistic appliances, gadgetry, cell phones and stuff, and cars and locations, and all throughout it, it's very working class neighborhoods with occasional uh, trips into the suburbs. And it's just, again, you can get away with things in Detroit now because there is nobody around. There are abandoned houses. A fairly long scene where they're investigating the guy that gave it to gave the curse to the main character, and we find an abandoned home that he was acting as if it was his because this is something you can just do now. When they uh, finally track him down to the suburbs, it's kind of nicer than all the other places that uh, they've been in, but you're perpetually seeing suburbs that are on their last legs, buildings that are abandoned when they try to uh, destroy it towards the end. It's in a pool that is not very well maintained uh, in terms of the facility. It looks like uh, it was a major fitness center that now they only have a pool open and everything else is boarded up. And all throughout it, you're just seeing Detroit and then worse parts of Detroit and worse parts of Detroit. It also reminded me a lot of Candyman in uh, terms of in Candyman, 
there was an urban legend of the Candyman in a uh, ghettoized part of Chicago, Cabrini Green. And this feel, it follows, the, like, the whole premise of it feels like something that would arise in a downtrodden people's neighborhood. It's just like, you know, you can't do the, you know, trying to scare your kids into not having sex. So you tell them if you do this, it will follow you forever and a day. You see a lot of scenes where Jay, the main character, is trying to explain this and get other people to believe her. And it feels like an urban legend that somebody would make up. So it kind of reminds me of that. But you get just the sense of these really crazy things happening in poor areas where, uh, you can't trust anybody. Uh, societal norms like utilities, uh, emergency services have sort of abandoned you. And unfortunately, this is where Detroit's at. I have absolutely no idea how they're going to fix it or if they can at this point. But uh, it makes for a lot of good fodder for horror movies. So, you know, hooray. So on that depressing note, I'll leave you until next week's uh, last installment of October triple features for this year of our Lord 2016. Uh, it's going to be really gruesome and really, really messed up. Can't wait to see that.